All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. So uh, my name is uh, Prashant Bhattacharya. And once again, uh, let me first begin by thanking all of you for joining us for this session today. Um, so I'm a research scientist with uh, the Institute of High Performance Computing in Singapore. I'm also an adjunct faculty at the NUS Business School. Um, and so I work with the network science and uh, graph analytics problems a lot. And so for this session, I'm, so I'll, be, I'm, uh, I'll be joined by uh, Andras and Fai, so who are representing uh, Lynx Analytics. And so to the later part of the session, so you'll be hearing from them. So um, the plan for this evening is to sort of uh, structure this talk into like four broad categories. For the first two categories that I'll be talking about, um, I plan to give all of you kind of a flavor of what network science really allows or affords you to do. And for some of you for whom this might be like the first talk that you're attending on graphs or networks, um, you'll find, uh, you should find some of the basics and the terminologies that I'm going to introduce to be particularly helpful. Uh, for others who are more familiar with, you know, doing network science projects or graph analytics uh, problems, um, some of this might feel a little repetitive towards the beginning. So you could try to be patient. So I'll, I'll come to the more applications and, and some of the more specific research problems that I'm working on towards the later part of my talk. And then uh, for the next two, two sessions, uh, I'm gonna pass it on to Andras and uh, Fai, who are gonna walk you through a live example um, using Link Skype, which is a graph analytics platform. And you're gonna see how you, know, you can take a real world example, uh, construct a network, and then try to derive insights that can put, have you know, some kind of business value uh, in, in the finance uh, industry. So one question uh, to begin with uh, that, uh, that I keep getting uh, from time to time is what really interests me about network science, right? Um, so I've been working in this field for many years now, and I could, I could tell you a lot of different aspects about graphs and networks that I find particularly exciting. But if I have to summarize it into one key point, it's, it's the fact that the graphical representation of data uh, lets you see existing phenomena or contexts in a very different light, okay? So let me give you a fun example of what I mean. So some of, so some of these uh, images on this slide might, might seem familiar to you, especially if you're a Game of Thrones fan. Um, but so uh, if you notice this network, it's actually a network of Game of Thrones characters. And uh, the way this network is constructed is if it, this is essentially a betrayal network. So what this means is every node in this network is a character from Game of Thrones. And if character A betrays character B in some episode and some season, you see a link between them, like a directed arrow from A to B, all right? And so the links are weighted based on the impact of the betrayal. So if someone kills the other person, so you'd see a very thick and bold link. Uh, if it's just some maybe you know, lying or cheating, uh, you'd see a thinner link. Um, what's also interesting is that you notice that some nodes are bigger than others. And that's because the nodes are, are weighted in terms of their degrees. So what this means is the nodes are larger in size proportional to the number of betrayals that they have either perpetrated or you know, been a victim of. That's why you see someone like Cersei Lannister, for instance, is a really large circle because she's always in the thick of things when it comes to betrayals. And what's also interesting is you'd notice that there are some links that are bold, but there are other links that are dashed, right? And so what the dashed links indicate are implied betrayals. So these are betrayals that have not been proven, but they're sort of like being suspected. Um, and so this has actually been constructed by observing the, the, the first five or six seasons of Game of Thrones. And again, if you've been living under a rock, you haven't been following Game of Thrones, uh, just by looking at this network, you can get a very uh, kind of a, like a bird's eye view of who are the main characters, what's like the, 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 the plot and the dynamic between these characters, uh, even without getting into some of the details, right? So there's a fun example of how you can see a very non-traditional uh, context from uh, using a network lens that gives you some quick insights. Right, so this is from a slightly uh, different context, but this is actually from a published paper from uh, way back in 2011. 
Um, so researchers, they actually analyzed over 50,000 recipes from around the world to understand uh, whether ingredients that commonly co-occur in a particular recipe share flavor compounds. So that was what the paper was about. But I just picked this one particular network uh, uh, to kind of emphasize a, a certain point. So if you look at this network, a node in this network is a food ingredient, right, that you use while cooking. And there's a link between two nodes if the ingredients co-occur in a particular recipe. Now, once again, I mean, this is just a simple visualization, but if you just by looking at this, this network diagram, you will be able to see clusters emerging that correlate with you know, certain geographic communities or cultures. So for instance, you would see that there are some ingredients that are almost um, specific to certain cultures, like for example, cream. Um, you can see cream is very popular in Western European and North American cuisines, but almost, like, almost absent in say East Asian cuisine. And they also see there are certain ingredients that are crossover ingredients that are common to multiple cultures, like you know, garlic or tomatoes. And so again, the point of showing you this is to emphasize that you don't have to be a you know, culinary science expert or a food network expert, but just by looking at a simple network visualization, you could quickly test and answer certain key hypotheses about you know, how people around the world cook and eat food. Finally, and I can, since we're in the, you know, the middle of a uh, global pandemic, I thought it might be interesting to point out that networks also serve as very important public health sensors. So the plots that you see on the screen were actually taken from a study that was conducted in 2009 when there was a particularly bad case of the H1N1 uh, flu in, in the US. And so this is a network of students from Harvard University and what the researchers basically showed were two things. First, uh, they pointed out that if you have systematic data about social networks of students, you would notice that the, the more central nodes in the network, so, and I'll talk about centrality in a little bit, but for now, think about nodes of students who are important in some sense, like maybe popular students within a student community. Uh, so central nodes have a higher probability of getting infected first. So that was the first insight. And subsequently, they were able to forecast or predict the spread of the disease through the network of these, friend, of these individuals quicker than, say, uh, you know, a randomly picked sample from the broader population. So they were able to show how, by just by monitoring the student network within a college, they were actually able to you know, predict the peak incidence of this particular disease almost two weeks ahead of the general population. All right. So again, this is a very classic example of what you can achieve in public health if you manage to get hold of systematic data on you know, social networks. And this actually, if you think about it, forms the basis of a lot of things like contact tracing that you see today uh, that's happening in so many countries. All right, so now that I've sort of given you like a quick overviews of how you know, popular, popular use cases of how networks are used in very different contexts, um, let me quickly run you through some very basics of how do you go about even thinking about networks in terms of a data structure, right? How do you even create your first network? And I think, again, this, is, this should be uh, of more interest if you're completely unfamiliar with graphs on networks. And if you've already been working with graphical data, then, I mean, you could probably find this a bit repetitive, but please bear with me. All right, so very simply put, a network is a collection of nodes and links, okay? And so the nodes could be one of many things, right? So in a, a popular understanding of social networks is that it's a network of individuals or people in society. But that's not, that's not, I mean, that's only one particular uh, use case of social networks. You can think of uh, nodes as products or entities, organizations, countries, um, you know, train stations in, in, a, in a subway, for example, right? All of these things can be modeled as networks. And then once you have the nodes, the relationships between these nodes can capture different aspects uh, of the network. So for example, in a social network, the, the links could be you know, friendship, familial ties, you know, kinship, it can be romantic relationships, academic collaborations, um, uh, you know, co-authors, et cetera. So one benefit of constructing a network is that it lets you answer predictive problems. So consider the social network that you see on the screen. 
uh, if, you, if, you, if you're given this network, you can actually try to ask questions that are predictive in nature. Like, okay, given this network, uh, who is Alice going to befriend next? Okay. You can also answer questions about explanation. So given that Alice and Charlie or Alice and Bob are friends in this network, what reasons do you think attributed to that friendship? Like, why did they become friends? So that's a question about explanation. So you can answer both predictive and explanatory questions given a certain network. So this is a, a use case that's probably more closer to business value. Um, so again, think about the previous network with Alice, Charlie, and Bob. Um, and if I pose this question that, uh, that, okay, given that Alice buys the latest model of an iPhone, what is the likelihood that Bob, being a friend of Alice, will buy it too? So this is actually a network effects question, right? Uh, the other way of framing this problem is, if you do observe that Bob buys an iPhone a couple of weeks later, can we attribute that purchase decision to the friendship tie, to the social network, right? So this is a question of attribution. Uh, so again, these are problems that that occur in many different contexts. The example that I, I gave you is uh, one of product product sales or product purchase. So uh, a key implication of this is if you do find that there is network effect in the sale of iPhones, uh, what can retailers or you know, product companies do to leverage this, right? So if I know that there is going to be a contagion in, in purchase behavior, can I you know, seed certain key users or key customers with promotions to amplify this network effect? Or can I uh, try to make sure that this network effect is not restricted to a particular part of the network, but spreads far and wide? So there are many things that I can do if I have some preliminary evidence of this kind of contagion. Right, so if you think about uh, the different kinds of relationships uh, while modeling networks, uh, you can model uh, you know, uh, graphs in terms of uh, whether the ties are directed or undirected, right? So in the previous example with the social network of Alice and Bob and Charlie, it's a friendship network. So it's largely undirected. There's no, you know, there's no direction. Uh, if you think about an information flow network, right? So if Alice you know, sends a message to Bob and Bob sends a message to Charlie, for example, and that's an example of a directed network that there is a, there's a direction to the flow. Uh, on the link. Uh, the networks can also be binary uh, or they can also be valued or weighted, right? So a binary network essentially means that a link either exists or doesn't exist. A valued or weighted network means that there is some idea of, a, of an edge or a link weight, right? So again, in terms of uh, the social networks, you can think of the friendship network as being a binary network. So either you're, you are friends or you're not friends. But if it's a communication network, like you know, uh, you call someone, then maybe the weight could be the volume of calls or text messages that you send a person. So in that case, it's a weighted and directed network. Okay. So uh, how do you go about representing network data in terms of data structures? I mean, this is useful if you're thinking in terms of implementing uh, a network, right? So the most popular data structure that's used, uh, or at least used to be uh, popular for uh, representing network data is uh, what's called an adjacency matrix, where uh, the, the two axes are essentially the nodes. And then you have a, a value in the, in, the, in the cell, which denotes whether there is a tie or not, right? So if you see, look at this matrix, if there is a, a link between nodes A and B, you see that, it, that you have a value of one in the matrix. And if there is no link, then it's, it's you either don't either it is a missing value or you can have zero depending on how you frame the matrix. Now the problem with storing um, networks as adjacency matrices is it's not very space space efficient, right? Especially if your network is extremely sparse, as most most social networks tend to be. So if most of your possible links don't exist, then you're essentially wasting a lot of space in storing missing values. So that's why you actually have other forms of uh, storing social networks. Uh, the, uh, you could store networks in the form of an adjacency list where you only store uh, the, the edges. Uh, you can also just save it as an edge list, which again is, is, is a very popular way of storing network data. An edge list is essentially, uh, you can think of it as just uh, uh, a, 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 a data frame where each, each row essentially is an edge. And you can have additional columns to capture other attributes like 
the edge weight, the edge ranks, et cetera. Okay. Right, so given that background of what networks look like and you know, what kind of data structures you can use to store networks, uh, let's move on to a, a key concept in, in network science, uh, which is about understanding network centrality. And um, again, you know, depending on what area you're working on, uh, this is potentially something that you're likely to run into, okay? So the idea of what a rich node in a network is important in some sense, right? Is a key question uh, in, in many, many different fields. Um, so what makes nodes important or influential? Uh, it depends strictly on the context, but there are certain ways of modeling network features that can help you answer these questions. So there are some non-network ways by which you can categorize nodes. So for example, you can think of demographic attributes like the age of a person or a gender of a person that's not dependent on the network. But you can think of structural measures or network dependent measures. And that's where centrality scores are particularly useful. So a uh, popular centrality measure that again, you're gonna uh, you know, hear about later in this session as well uh, is the idea of degree centrality. And degree essentially just means the number of links a node is connected to. And if it's a directed network, you can have two different types of degree. So in degree would be the number of nodes that are kind of incident on the node. So they're basically links that end in the node and out degree would be the number of links that flow out of the node, okay? And so again, in the, in, in the context of an adjacency matrix, uh, you can think of uh, out degree as kind of a row sum and in degree as kind of a column sum, okay? So over here, you can think out degree uh, of C would essentially be three. So, right, you have C to B, C to D, and C to E. And in degree of C would be one because you just have um, uh, one, one node uh, that's coming in, or one edge that's coming in uh, to C uh, from E, all right? Now, you could think of other types of centrality as well. So what degree really captures as a metric is uh, really how active or how popular a particular node is. Okay, because it just measures the number of different ties that's connected to that particular node. But what if you wanted to capture other attributes about a node? So here's another example. Um, so the closeness centrality measure is a measure of distance of a node. So if you want to understand uh, how close uh, is a particular node from every other node in a network, then maybe a good metric to focus on is uh, or basically any distance-based metric and closeness is a popular one, okay? Uh, so closeness basically captures, is, is, is a function of the distance between a particular node from every other node in the network, okay? The, the other interesting metric that I wanted to just quickly introduce to you is uh, the betweenness centrality. And again, this is a computationally very expensive metric to compute, it will take a lot of time to compute this measure, but sometimes it's a very useful measure to understand uh, kind of like the brokerage potential of a particular node. So what betweenness really captures is given all the shortest paths in your network, okay? So if you have, um, so think about the shortest path from one node to any other node in the network. So then you can think about all pairs of shortest paths between all pairs of nodes, right? And then for a given node, the betweenness would be the proportion of shortest paths that include that particular node. Okay, so again, think about this, this particular measure, right? So what this measure is really capturing is how many shortest paths include the focal node for which you want to calculate the betweenness. Let me give you an example of where betweenness can be particularly interesting. So I don't know if you've seen this particular uh, TV show called Indian Matchmaking on Netflix. Uh, and if you haven't seen, you could, you could give it a skip it's but not particularly uh, memorable, but uh, I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, so this is an interesting show about uh, how this lady uh, who is a professional matchmaker works with prospective candidates across US and India and tries to pair them, right? So for, you know, for, you know, for marriage. And uh, th the reason why she's so powerful or effective in this kind of a business model is because if you think about this network of prospective grooms and brides, uh, most of these shortest paths include her because she's kind of sits in the middle. And so she controls the flow of information and flow of resource 
in this kind of like you know uh, Indian and Indians in um, in the U.S. marriage market, okay, and so that's what gives her power in the network. So in terms of the metrics that I just explained to you, this would translate to someone having very high betweenness centrality, okay. Uh, if you look at the, the network on the left, you'd notice that you know this particular node H has very high betweenness centrality. What's also interesting is you have other nodes that also have high centrality values depending on what measure you're looking at. So this is probably a key point to remember from the past couple of slides, that there is no one central node in a network or one important node. Your definition of you know, an influencer or, or an important node would depend on what aspect of importance are you really focusing on, okay? So that's, this is what I want you guys to take away from these couple of slides. Right, so for the last couple of uh, sessions, I'm, I mean the slides, I'm gonna talk about two broad classes of problems that you can solve with whatever you've seen so far about social networks. Uh, the first class of problem is about prediction, right? So there are two types of predictive problems that you can solve using networks. The first is about predicting links or edges on a network. So a good example of that would be all your recommendation systems on digital platforms, right? So if you're on LinkedIn and you get, you know, friend requests uh, or requests for, or for, for, for you know, connecting with others, that's being driven by a link prediction algorithm at the background, right? Um, think about like Tinder or dating sites. Uh, the, the matches that the, the app shows you is based on uh, you know, a fairly complicated link prediction problem. And, and depending on the choices that you make, you, you, the learning algorithm can learn and improve itself. Now, you can also think about the other kind of predictive problem on networks, which is about predicting node level attributes. So the previous problem is about predicting links. Now, th the second problem is about predicting some kind of node labels. Um, so in this case, given the network structure, uh, and other node lab labels, can you predict the label of a focal node? That's the problem. And later on uh, in, in the session, you're gonna look at an actual example of where we're gonna predict uh, stock prices of companies uh, using network information. So that's a good example of uh, node attribute classification. So an another uh, context where you know, this network-based predictive models are particularly useful is in insurtech or uh, especially, but specifically in you know fraud detection in insurance. So this is an example of you know a collision insurance where you have two individuals who are kind of like masquerading as the driver and the victim in different applications to create fraudulent you know loan claims, um, uh, sorry insurance claims. And so what you can do is if you represent this phenomena using a network of how these individuals. Uh, behave as entities and how these entities are connected in different applications, you will be able to find out or uncover these cartels of fraudulent uh, insurance claims. So this is an actual use case of how you can use uh, these node level attribute prediction models to flag whether a claim uh, application is fraudulent or not. All right, so the final part I just wanted to quickly leave you with is the idea of causal inference on networks. And this is something that's personally very interesting to me because a lot of my research falls into this space. Uh, the, the reason why causal inference on networks is a tricky problem is because so far uh, you've looked at how interventions on a particular person or a node changes the behavior of that particular node, right? So that's a, a very kind of a, a, like a, a causal, a typical causal problem, right? Now in the network, in the context of a network, it's slightly trickier because now you are looking at the effects of intervention or treatment on a particular node on other nodes that are linked to this node. Right? So that's the network effect problem uh, in causality. So such kind of peer influence problems are exist in almost any context imaginable. So for example, you can think of contagion in the purchase of products or adoption of products. I, I remember the iPhone example that I told you about is a good example of this. Uh, diffusion of innovations uh, or even like diseases and disorders. So this is again a, a use case that's particularly relevant now. So how do you understand spreading processes on networks? It's, that's a causal inference problem as well. Voting behavior is also becoming increasingly important today. There are actually papers that show how, you know, if publicly available signals of 
your voting behavior can actually influence your friends, right? Um, so there are studies now that, that look into those kind of contagion behavior, right? Um, before I go into uh, an actual use case of, of, of a research project that I'm working on, I just had one slide to emphasize that, you know, a, a conventional way of uh, solving causal uh, uh, analytics problems uh, is not straightforward on networks. So a lot of you would be using A-B testing or, you know, in many different contexts. So it's basically a way of doing randomized experiments to, uh, to, to come up with, you know, unbiased estimates of your intervention. So that's what A-B tests uh, do. Now, the problem with doing A-B testing on networks is that um, when you randomize, right, uh, you can create a lot of different problems depending on what, what your application is. So let me give you a simple example. So let's assume that you're a tech company that's just launched a new video player, uh, okay, an online video chat application, for example, and you're randomly doing an A-B test on your network where you're, you're, you know, you've taken a pool of users to whom you've launched that product, and then you have uh, other users to whom uh, you've, you've not, you've, other users you've kept in the control group. But what happens if there's one user who has this product of doing a video chat, but none of that person's peers are in the treatment group, right? So then who's this person going to talk to? So these are the practical problems that can arise when you do uh, randomization on networks. Um, there's also uh, the problem of network interference. Now think about a, a graph, right? So it's, it's, it's a connected, uh, in a connected graph, it's theoretically impossible to separate a group of nodes from another, a, a second group of nodes. So you cannot have a clean treatment control split in a connected graph. So you need to resort to statistical ways of correcting for possible transmission or spillover of the treatment across groups. Uh, and finally, uh, how, do you how do you ensure that even if you're able to create these partitions in networks, that you're able to preserve the network structure for these two groups? And if you're not able to do that, then the change in network structure can be a confounding factor uh, uh, that can you know, prevent you to est you know, estimate your actual treatment effect in an unbiased fashion, all right? So that's, that becomes a problem. So there are, these are just three problems that you might face when you, if you're trying to do some kind of randomized test uh, on networks to create causal estimates, all right? So um, before I hand over to uh, Andras, I just wanted to leave you with one example of a project that I'm working on, and I, hopefully this is gonna be of some interest to you. So this, is, um, uh, 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 this comes from the field of microfinance, uh, and again, for some of you who might be familiar with this, uh, microfinance is increasingly popular in emerging economies, uh, especially in Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, South Asia, Africa, where and, and, and really helps people in countries without a more established banking and credit infrastructure, right? So people in a lot of countries need access to affordable loans or credit, uh, but they don't necessarily have either the banking infrastructure Structure or the necessary financials and collaterals to apply for structured loans. So this is where micro lending and microfinance institutions come in and offer an, you know, a, a, a way to secure small amounts of loans, but at you know, reasonable interest without collaterals. So one of the problems that we were trying to investigate uh, in collaboration with the micro lending company in Southeast Asia is whether there is evidence of a network effect in the loan defaulting behavior. So what this means is if I take a micro loan and I default on my payments, is there evidence that my immediate peers or my friends who are also users of this particular app or in a service, are they going to default on their loans as well? Is there evidence of that? And can, or, or, or rather, can that default behavior be attributed to our, our network tie, right? So the second order problem that we're trying to look at is if there is evidence of contagion in default behavior, uh, can we attribute that to some individual level factor like their risk, right? The credit risk, which you know, the companies generally assess in the financial sector. So this is actually, this is like a snapshot of uh, two different samples from the data set, just to give you a feel of what the data looks like. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see a low credit risk sample. On the right-hand side, you see a high credit risk sample. Uh, the nodes in red are nodes that have paid back successfully. 
the nodes in blue are nodes that have defaulted. So these are borrowers who have defaulted. Uh, the nodes in gray are nodes about whom we don't have any information. We know that these borrowers exist, but we don't have any data about them. So it's a very interesting you know, data context, also network context. So it's a very incomplete network, but we do have some structural information about some uh, borrowers. Now, again, not surprisingly, you'll notice that in the high credit risk sample, there are a lot more uh, number of defaults, right? It's a lot more of these blue nodes. And what we want to estimate is whether there is some kind of contagion in how these blue nodes default. Is it because of an initial set of defaulters that cascades into a, a bigger sample of defaulters, right? So without getting into the specifics, um, we, what we did, we used a variant of what's known as network autocorrelation model. And again, if you're interested in this line of work, you can always reach out to me offline. We can, we can have a conversation. But just to give you like a, a, like a preview of some of the findings that we uh, observed, we found that in the low credit risk sample, most of the borrowers do not show any network effects. So you'd see a histogram that's centered around zero roughly, right? So there's no evidence that there is a contagion effect in, for the low credit risk sample. Very interestingly, for the high credit risk sample, we see almost a bimodal distribution. So there's a sample of users, or borrowers rather, uh, that sh who show negative influence, which means if their peers default, they tend to pay back on time and vice versa. But we also see a second group of borrowers who show positive influence effect, which means if their peers default, they tend to default as well. Now, this is very interesting because using this insight, uh, micro lending companies can both understand how default behavior percolates in a, in a network of borrowers, but they can also potentially intervene and prevent some of these cascades from you know, uh, beginning or spreading, right? And this is very useful for in a context like microfinance because these are essentially small institutions that need to survive on you know, very limited uh, portfolio values, right? So if, you, if they see a very high loan loss rate, they might not be able to service new loans and then the whole system can collapse. But it's not like major banks that can sustain with relatively high loan loss rates, right? So this is a good example of where network science can come in and address a very critical problem uh, in, the, in the financial sector. All right, so with that background, um, I want to hand it over to Andras, uh, who will be walking you through um, a different kind of financial sector uh, use case. In this case, we are actually, we try to uh, uh, get uh, stock price data from for uh, uh, S&P 500 companies. And based on a correlation of their, uh, of, a, of, a, of a window, of a moving window of prices, we try to create a network of, you know, price mobility, but right, two companies which have a similar trajectory of price movements are linked. And then based on that, Andres is going to show you a visualization of these networks, um, how we can identify communities in this network of companies, and also a very interesting predictive problem where we're using network structures to predict uh, important um, financial outcome. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining this session. Uh, yeah, I think you can see my screen. So, so basically, uh, in the last, uh, I don't know, half hour, 40 minutes, I think Prashant did a fantastic job in motivating why you want to use networks. At least I'm super convinced. Well, I was already super convinced before the session, but still, I think it's a, it was a very good summary on why you would want to, to use networks. So now where I want to pick this up is if you already decided that you want to use networks, what should be your next step? And uh, my totally unbiased opinion is that, uh, well, you should download Linkskite. So, uh, so what is Linkskite? Basically, uh, Links Analytics is a consultancy, like a data analytics consultancy specialized in, in network analytics. And we, we first implemented Linkskite as an internet tool because we, we had trouble executing our network analytics projects. It was just no good tool available to uh, to be able to efficiently and conveniently uh, do graph analytics and, and do this graph centric data mining. And uh, by now it, it grew into a pretty comprehensive tool which can cover like the, the whole spectrum of, of a graph machine learning project. And this June, we just open sourced the, the whole thing. So we are, we are super excited to put it in the hands of data scientists and I really hope some of you uh, will find this useful. 
So to, to convince you about my biased opinion, uh, I'm going to show you a, a little bit of, of use case. Uh, but before that, maybe a little bit more about this slide. So, so what, what is Linkskite? If I want to define Linkskite in one sentence, I usually uh, compare it to some other tools. Like uh, I'm sure many of you know tools like Rapid Miner or SPSS Modeler or, or all those, uh, those traditional data mining tools, which allows the data scientists to very efficiently and uh, iteratively uh, work on certain data mining problems. So Linkskite is, is the same, except all those things that travel uh, between the nodes of your workflow are not uh, tables as in those traditional tools, but they are graphs. So, so Linkskite is basically a graph data mining tool. Uh, yeah, it can, it can import data, make them into graph, run various graph algorithms, uh, Build, build complex pipelines out of these graph algorithms, look at the data at various ways, and, and also combine with, with other uh, tools outside of Linkskite, including code-related code stuff like notebooks or, uh, or just data-driven integration. I will also show that a little bit. So without further ado, uh, let me show you. So, okay, so this is Linkskite. Uh, I already opened the project called Meetup Demo. And uh, what you will see soon is that we are going to, to build a, a workflow out of boxes. Uh, and these boxes are basically representing some operations. But what we are starting with here, what I already uh, put on is uh, two import boxes. I just dropped two CSV files into the workspace. And this is the data we are going to talk about in the next, I don't know how many minutes. Uh, Basically, what we start with is, is a very simple uh, price uh, time information. Like uh, we have here the uh, S&P 500 uh, stocks, uh, and for every day, for I think almost a 10-year period, uh, we basically have the closing prices of those particular uh, stocks. Uh, there is another table I'm going to use, which is basically just some metadata. So out of these S&P uh, tickers, we know the name of the company and and the sector. Uh, so first, I, I really want to give the message that uh, creating a graph in Link Skype is super easy if you, if you actually have a, have a graph. Like for example, if you have a transaction network, you really just uh, put in one box and you have the network as a graph. Now in this case, the graph is not trivial. I'm still going to, to show you one very simple one. Like if you look again at this table, like we can create a graph out of the the companies and the sector. It's not going to be an interesting graph, but just to, to show you how simple it is. Uh, like basically there is this uh, build graph operations. I say, use a table as a graph. I link this thing in here. Uh, and all I have to tell Linkskite is which columns in this table, which I show you again, should be used as the source and destination IDs for the edges. So for source ID, I'm going to use let's say the name of the company and for destination, I'm going to use the sector. Uh, so now we end up with a graph with, I don't know, 500 vertices and uh, roughly 500 edges. It's a very, very boring graph. Another address I'm going to show you. Uh, it's basically like what you see here is that there is this uh, CLAM incorporated and this company is, is in, the, in the industrial sector. So we have an edge from this guy to, to this category. Uh, I can walk around in this view. So I can see that now we see all the vertices which are connected to this guy, which is just one, like every company is in a single uh, sector. But if I choose this to be the, uh, the center, then I get just a little bit more interesting visualization. So now I basically see all the companies in this graph which are in this, uh, in this industries uh, sector. So again, this is a very boring graph. I'm not going to talk anything more about that. Like the only reason I showed this is, is that this is that easy in links, like just one box. If you have some sort of uh, already graph data, uh, you can very easily get it in and do all the stuff that uh, I'm going to do in the future. But what we are going to do now is a little bit more uh, involved. Uh, we are going to actually create a graph from this table. Uh, and the way we are going to do it is uh, we are going to look at the correlation. We are going to uh, link two symbols if their day by day price is very correlated. Like, uh, like when one moves up, the other also moves up. To do that, I'm actually going to use some Python code, which is also a 
uh, fairly uh, important uh, important notion. Then in Linskite, usually you can do everything by just putting boxes next to each other and selecting some parameters. But if you do want to do something custom and something special, then you can always do the advanced stuff like easy things are easy and hard things are possible because you can always literally use Python and whatever library is available in Python is available for you in Linkscat. So what happens in this particular case, I'm just very briefly showing this code, not going into the details. Uh, like you can read uh, in this GitHub project, a lot of detail about how to, to do these correlation networks. This is basically a simplified version of the, of the code explained here. But what happens uh, is basically we are loading this price data. We are cleaning it up a little bit, throwing uh, away uh, duplicates and, uh, and then uh, there is the most critical line. Uh, here we, we compute some sort of a normalization and uh, we are removing time balance. But at the end of the day, all we do is, is we are doing a Pearson correlation, totally standard uh, NumPy pandas code. There is nothing in sky specific or nothing too crazy about that. We really end up with a matrix where every two uh, ticker has a correlation number. And then what we do here, we just iterate over all the members of this matrix. And if the correlation is bigger than 0 0.7, then we are uh, outputting an edge. Basically, we are outputting the, the source uh, uh, index, the destination index, and the, the correlation. Uh, of that uh, of that particular pair, and given this, basically here we are just generating a list of these these edge data, and I'm outputting this to uh, to Linkskite uh, as a as the edge data. So how to take this code from my Emacs to to Linkskite? I, well, I'm going to just copy paste. Uh, there is a box here uh, in Linkskite which is uh, in the build graph category. Uh, we are going to create a graph in Python. Uh, basically, I just copy the code here. There is one more thing I have to say is that I have to specify uh, the schema of this graph. Like what are, the, what are the edge and vertex attributes that are being generated by this Python code? Uh, let me also copy paste that too, just to make sure I'm not wasting too much time with writing text. Uh, so after these two parameters, what comes out of this box is, is already a graph. Like we have these 505 vertices, which is exactly the, the number of the S&P 500 uh, stocks. Uh, and we see the metadata here, so 500 vertices, around 2,000 uh, edges. And on each vertex, we have this ticker as a, as a vertex attribute. So every vertex has uh, the symbol. And on the edges, there is a correlation number. Uh, so in the end, I think you can also see that the, the range of this is going from, uh, from 0 0.7 to almost 1, which is expected because we were thresholding at uh, 0 0.7. So we only kept the strongly correlated uh, pairs of, of diggers. So one more thing I'm going to do, uh, I want to use the, the sector property here. So I'm going to, to merge this on my graph. Uh, there is an operation called use table as uh, vertex attributes. Uh, all I do is that I say that on this graph, I want to put the data from this table. And I have to explain like what, what is the ID attribute in the graph, which I can use to, to connect to what ID attribute in the table. And that's it. After this operation, uh, I have a more rich graph. You see, I have three more vertex attributes. Uh, which were coming uh, from the table. So at this point, it's probably time to actually look at our graph. So we are not very lucky. This is a very boring vertex. It doesn't even have any neighbors. Uh, the fact that I just see this vertex wrong means that uh, the system automatically picked the vertex, which doesn't even happen to have uh, any uh, uh, any edges, but the good thing I can, of course, choose which vertex I want to see. I'm going to look at this particular guy with the arrow K uh, ticker. 
So now we have at least something. So there is this guy that I chose, uh, this uh, circle around it means that this is a center. So we are looking at all the neighbors of this guy and these are the neighbors. Of course, I can't understand anything of this graph. So we need to put some attributes onto the visualization. <clears throat> I'm going to put name as a as a label and also maybe sector as a color on this visualization. So at this point, we see all the companies. So Rockwell Automation Incorporated is is highly correlated with Amazon, Eaton, Dover, those those guys here, and actually everybody is in the same sector. Like this is going to be a, a very prevailing thing that that yes, of course, companies in the same sector tend to be uh, very correlated. So what I can do, I can add some more center. So let's see, I also want to see the neighbors of Honeywell. So I add him to the centers. So now I get a bunch of more industrials uh, companies, but now actually we have a connection in materials, which again makes sense. Like of course, materials and industries are very correlated. And if I add this guy as well, uh, then I should get a, <clears throat> a bunch of companies uh, which are also in the material space. So remember, when creating the graph, we didn't use the sectors at all. This is all just correlation. But yeah, obviously, correlations and, uh, and sectors are, are very related <clears throat> to each other. So OK, uh, this is our graph. Uh, as a next step, let's do something that, uh, that Prashanta suggested us to do. Let's look at centrality metrics. It's, again, super easy in Linkskite. Like, uh, we have, a, we have a lot of uh, graph computations available. I can just pull in like, okay, I want to compute page rank. I also want to compute, say, centrality. And I also want to compute, let's say, uh, degree. <clears throat> and maybe let's also compute clustering coefficient. So these are all the operations you can do in Inkscite and it's categorized. So one way to do it is just look at the category. Actually, uh, when you get more experience, you usually prefer this one. Like if I start writing clustering coefficient, then uh, it finds the box for me. <clears throat> so all of these boxes have parameters. Like for example, in page rank, I can set up uh, quite a few stuff, but I think the defaults are, are fine for me. Same thing for centrality. I even have a few different algorithms, but I'm just going to stick with the defaults now. Uh, and so at the end of the day, like after running all these uh, all these operations, we have an even richer graph. Like we have a bunch of more vertex attributes, centrality, clustering, coefficient, degree, page rank, uh, that are added by uh, by these boxes. So let's take a look. Like what I can now do is is take this uh, same visualization box. I was just copy pasting this box here. Uh, let's take a look again. Uh, and let's put the, let me make it a little bit bigger. Let's, let's put the, the stack on it. So for example, if I put page rank, <clears throat> what I didn't want is a label, let's put the size and keep name as a label. Uh, you can see that, that these uh, more central things like this Honeywell, which led us to the other other uh, category, Ilionas, are a li little bit bigger. <clears throat> so they are more central nodes according to page rank. And here as well, like this PPG is, is a relatively central node. Those are a little bit less. Um, <clears throat> the other one, uh, just like. So, so the other that I find pretty interesting is actually clustering coefficient. So what clustering coefficient means is how connected your neighborhood is. So basically your clustering coefficient is high if all your friends know each other. Your clustering coefficient is low if you, if you have a lot, of, uh, lot of connections in different groups. Like uh, in this visualization, you can see that actually these two guys have the lowest clustering coefficient which makes sense because they are not uh, only connected to, to the same clique of companies, like this within uh, industry or him within, uh, uh, within materials, but they are also connected cross to each other. And uh, that's why that uh, clustering coefficient is low. Uh, okay, so, so what I can also do is actually just take a look, let me create another visualization. 
that I literally just uh, look at the whole graph. To do that, uh, I can say that I actually want to see all vertices. So this is not a very typical way to look at the graph actually, because most of the graphs are just way too big to, uh, to do that. But luckily for us, it's a fairly small graph, just 500-ish vertices. Uh, we can actually visualize it like that. You can see that there are these, uh, these groups and these, uh, these denser areas in the graph, which is uh, made clear by the visualization, which tries to, to locate vertices in a way that, that edges are as short as possible. It's uh, basically like a spring, spring simulation-based uh, layout. Uh, if I put again sector as a color on the vertices, uh, then again, we can see, see that, that these uh, things are highly correlated with the, with the sector. So yeah, we have the real estate guys here, and uh, there, has, uh, there are some consumer discretionary guys here. Uh, what is also noteworthy here is that the financials are actually uh, in the thick part of the graph, but they are kind of spread all over the place, which makes sense because of course, financial companies are, are connected to, to all the rest of the economy. And we can see that with this 0 0.7 uh, threshold, we were not so unlucky to pick a vertex at the beginning, which has no neighbors. Like there are a lot of these isolated vertices, which, which are not correlated to any, any other ticker uh, at this uh, particular threshold. So this is nice. Uh, we, have a, we have a sort of overview of our graph. Uh, what we can also do is to, to try to concentrate on the on the important vertices in this graph. So what I'm going to do is, again, I'm just making a copy of this, this visualization. I do everything as before. Okay. But I'm actually interested only in the important vertices, like which are the important vertices in this graph? and how are they connected to each other? So, so what I'm going to do is I put a filter here. I say that I only want to see guys which have a page rank higher than 2.5. If I do this, then of course I have a very, very different picture. And now it makes sense to put on the names because in the previous one, there were too many uh, vertices to, to make sense of them. Uh, but now we can see that, yeah, these, these are the, the most important vertices and you can again see like this maybe the name is too much maybe let's put the ticker to keep it a little bit more uh, more visible so again you can see that that the most important vertices are uh, are typically again clustered around uh, around sectors um, and and yeah it's also interesting that, that the highest page rank ones are of course the, the financial guys uh, energy is also high page rank. Uh, utilities is another, another group of, of high page rank vertices uh, and so on. So one last thing that like, one last way that, I, that we can look at the graph. So I told earlier that uh, this full graph visualization is usually worthless. It's just simply, even if, the, if your browser and CPU can handle the load, your brain cannot. Like if you see a hairball of a million vertices, it's, it's not very useful. So uh, there is another way to look at graphs, which we call the bucketed view. Uh, it's especially designed to, <clears throat> to have an understanding of the, of the total graph. So I switch over here to bucketed view. I will need to have a lot of buckets. And then first, let's see what we get now. Well, it's an extremely insightful visualization. Looking at this, you know everything about this graph. What, what is happening? Why am I saying it makes any sense? So what is happening is that all the vertices uh, are clumped together into a bucket. And what we visualize is, is how the, the edges go among the buckets. Now, there is only one bucket. So of course, all the edges go from this bucket to this same bucket. Uh, there is nothing we learned. But what we can do is, is tell Linksky to split up this bucket based on uh, various attributes. So what I'm going to tell it first is that, okay, let's actually use a uh, page rank to, to split up this bucket. Now it's getting more interesting. So what we see is that most of the guys, 311 guys have very low page rank. These are probably most of the isolated points. Uh, there are some very high page rank guys, 
but the majority of the collections actually belong to these uh, to these guys with the page rank around two. Like you can see that these this very thick arrow shows that most of the connection with the graph goes between two vertices within this page rank uh, uh, page rank uh, zone. What I can also do is add another uh, attribute on the y degree. Now we also see that that yes, surely like as expected, degree and page rank are correlated. Like if you have high degree, you tend to have higher page rank. But of course, these are not the same metrics. Like you can see that this is just a correlation, but not a not an equality. Uh, it's also possible maybe instead of page rank, let's put on centrality. Now this is an interesting one. Like it turns out that if we if we uh, segment our graphs based on centrality then we even discover like uh, two uh, connected components. Like these two guys, like the, the vertices here and the vertices here are either not connected at all or maybe connected with some very, very uh, few number of edges. So we, we actually end up with a low centrality cluster in our graph and the high centrality cluster. Uh, we can actually investigate this. And of course, it again turns out that certain uh, certain industries tend to be uh, low centrality guys and other uh, industries belong here. Uh, but it's kind of a, a way that like interesting insights can come up, come out with, uh, with looking at this kind of visualization. OK. Um, now we looked at individual vertices. And actually, this is the point where uh, where I can connect back to uh, to Marco's question, uh, like, does it make sense to uh, to try to to compress the graph as he said it? Uh, like, how we call it is is basically merging uh, certain vertices. And what I'm going to do here is uh, is merging the vertices by industry. So I want to match by sector. Uh, and I can also compute some uh, uh, some uh, some aggregated attributes. Like we definitely want the count of symbols, like how many companies are uh, belonging to a certain sector. And we also we can compute, let's say, the average of our uh, centrality metrics. And let's see what we get at the end. So now, as a result of this box, uh, we go from a 500 vertex graph to an 11 vertex graph. And uh, let's look at it. We have only 11 vertices. Let us show them all. And yep. Let me you do the usual stuff of putting the, the sector as a label, maybe also the color. Uh, and uh, so now we see basically a graph on our sectors. Like what is of course the first thing is, is that sure all the, all the edges, like almost all the edges are actually within sectors. Uh, so in this, in this correlation level, uh, most of the correlation go within sector. And there are a few uh, weak edges that go uh, cross these uh, these buckets. You can also look at like I don't know maybe if I use clustering coefficient average as a color, then we can also see stuff that uh, which are the industries which tend to have high clustering coefficient vertices, which are the industries that tend to have uh, very low uh, clustering coefficient uh, industries. It's actually again very. Uh, very along our intuition, like financials have very low clustering coefficient, which means that financial institutions, neighborhoods are less like cliques, which means that yes, financial in institutions tends to, to have friends in, uh, in very different, uh, different kind of uh, cliques or, or communities. Uh, all right, so, so this is one way. Actually, I want to show another way to, uh, to cut up our graph. Uh, so now we, we actually use an existing attribute uh, that is a very good uh, categorization for the graph. But what we can do is we can also ask Kling Sky to, to figure out the groups themselves based on just the, the structure. There are actually different ways to do that, but the one I'm wanting to show 
<clears throat> with modular clustering. So what modular clustering does, I don't even uh, have to do much. Maybe, okay, I can use correlation as a, as a weight attribute. I don't say anything about attributes here. We are really just using the graph structure. And what is happening is that Linksky tries to create uh, clusters which are as little connected to each other and as much connected to themselves via edges. Uh, as a result of this operation, we have a new thing here called the segmentation. So, so what is a segmentation? Is It is what it sounds like. Basically, all vertices of the graph are now, now put into these groups, which are called modular clusters. And uh, we can see some basic statist statistics. So we actually ended up with a lot of uh, modular clusters. <clears throat> and they are covering the whole base. Like they, every single vertex is in one of these clusters. Why, why do we have so many modular clusters? Of course, because of those uh, insane number of isolated vertices. So if I look at the histogram of the size of these clusters, I see that most of these, uh, actually 319 out of the modular clusters are at most three uh, uh, large. Uh, those are not very interesting clusters. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to filter out the, the small one. We have a filter by attributes operation. And uh, I'm actually not want, don't want to filter the main graph, but I want to filter the modular clusters. And I only want to, <clears throat> to keep those where the size is uh, larger than four. If I look at this, the graph after this one, I end up with only eight modular clusters, uh, now uh, much more healthy, healthier uh, size distribution. So again, uh, let's take a look at that. that. So as usual, we want all Ah, yeah, so, so these are all the modular clusters. Now I forgot to do one thing. Uh, there are no edges, like we don't have edges uh, between the, the clusters. These are just, just blobs, just sets. I can actually, like the one thing I can do is I can put the size of these. Now I see that, okay, there are bigger sets and there are smaller sets, but this is not what I wanted to show you. I do want edges. Uh, luckily, there is, a, there is an operation which, takes the edges from the, from the original graph and pushes it forward to a segmentation. What it means if there is an edge between two points, then we add an edge between the, uh, the segments of those points. So if I do this, I tell it to do it on modular clusters, then finally we have edges. And again, of course, like in this graph, it was easy, but Linkskite did an almost perfect job. Like, all these things are not, not only modular clusters, but mostly connected components. Like there are absolutely no edges, except <clears throat> in some uh, rare condition. Uh, so now what might be interesting, uh, and this is the last thing I, I do in the, in the visualization world, is these automatically found clusters. How do they relate to the, to the sectors that we, that we knew from the start? Uh, to do that, actually, let me combine these two things, like this path here and this. Uh, <clears throat> it's actually super easy. Like all I do, I, I just change the routing here, which is actually uh, shows how, how easy it is to, to play around with stuff in Linkscape. So now I do all this modular clustering stuff uh, before I merging the vertices by the sector. So now <clears throat> what we end up with is a graph where the base graph has 11 uh, vertices. They are all categorized into these uh, into these modular clusters, uh, which I have eight of. And uh, and interestingly, they are of course covering these vertices multiple times. It's better to show it than to explain. So this is just the left side, the the base graph. But what I'm going to do now is add the visualization, the the modular clusters. And I not only want, so this is just one of the clusters. Uh, let me add all of them. 
and here we are. So basically what you see here is that uh, the automatically found clusters are very often one, almost one-on-one -on -one, uh, correspond to a sector. But in some cases, it's not exactly what's happening. Like this guy is actually a, a shared cluster between <clears throat> materials and industrials. And this is actually a pretty mixed one uh, among different categories, uh, which shows that actually there are more here than, than just what, uh, what is determined by the, uh, <clears throat> by the sectors of these companies. One more thing I quickly wanted to show because this is a bit, bit lame that these are just uh, these uniform blue balls. I would like to label those, but how, how could I label those? I mean, they don't have any, any intrinsic property of, these are just, just modules which are found based on the graph structure. So what I'm going to do is to try in each of these group, find a company which is somehow uh, representative of that group. So what I would like to do is that each of these bobs should be uh, labeled by the company which has the highest page rank within this group. Uh, you can also do that in Inkscribe. So there is a, a weighted aggregate to segmentation operation. I'm going to do this here. So what I want to do, I want to work again on the modular clusters segmentation, and I want to take the page rank uh, as the as the so-called weight, which isn't really going to be a weight in our case, as you will see in a second. And then I want to take the name of the company uh, by max weight. So what it means that each group has multiple companies, I want Linkskai to choose the one company with the highest page rank, and for that company, take the name into the segmentation. So the result of this is this ag, uh, in the modular clusters, we now have this somewhat ugly named attribute, name by max weight by page rank. This is really just name of companies. So every single modular cluster is now labeled by, by the name of a company. Uh, so with that, I can make this visualization a little bit prettier. I can put this new label on my visualization. And yeah, why not put the size also so that we see how big are all those modular clusters. So now we did see that, okay, for example, this modular cluster, which is very much in line with the financials is dominated by T row price, which is not very surprising. Uh, and I mean, all those other companies, I don't know much, but uh, yeah, sure. Noble Energy sounds like an energy company, apparently an important one if we look at uh, stock correlation. So, okay. Uh, I think that's about the, the exploration, like how you can take a graph and, and with Linkskite very easily uh, generate a lot of different properties, graph metrics, and, and look at it and, and get insights. Oh, actually one more thing which I wanted to show, which is also a very, very cool feature. Like uh, if I look, let's say this is our ultimate visualization. Uh, it's pretty and everything, but, but what if I want to to look at this same visualization using a different threshold. Like remember at the very, very beginning in the code, there was this 0 0.7. Why is it 0 0.7? Why did I threshold at 0 0.7? Uh, uh, honestly, I have no idea. It just gave a reasonable amount of edges, which is easy to work with. But let's see what happens if I change this threshold here. And I literally just go in the box, change this threshold. Uh, and now everything is recomputed. So all the boxes that uh, that we did at the beginning is now recomputed uh, using the new graph, and we end up with a very different visualization. You see, if the if the threshold is done differently, then uh, all the edges are within sectors is not really true anymore. Like you see that there are very strong correlation uh, among these different sectors. Still, actually, the modular clusters are are pretty good at capturing big parts of, of certain sectors. So of course it's still true that, that edges correlate with sectors, but, but it's not so, uh, not so black and white picture anymore uh, that almost all edges are, are within sectors. Okay, let's go back to 0 0.7. And, and the last thing I want to show is, is okay, Okay, all well, this is very nice to, to look at graph. It's pretty and everything. Uh, and it's a pleasure to, 
to play around with links kite, add different parameters, try different ways. But what if we actually want to use these attributes to, uh, to something useful, like maybe some prediction problem? So until now, I built uh, this workspace one by one just to show how easy it is. But now I'm going to copy in a, a bit more complex uh, workspace. Uh, basically, every workspace section uh, you have uh, can be copy pasted as a as a YAML file. So what I have here in my Emacs is really a texture representation of a of a Link's Kite workspace. So again, what I'm going to do uh, and to generate something like that, you just select a few boxes and press Control C. Uh, what I'm going to do is now the opposite. I take this uh, this YAML, uh, put it on my clipboard, and I can copy this in here. So what I'm what is going to happen in this workspace is a little bit of of modeling. Uh, let me show you. Uh, first of all, I have to connect in the graph we created here. And now we should be all set. Uh, we are also, we are going to start again uh, with the table at the beginning. Like every company, we have a date, we have a price. Uh, but we want to do something very simple. This is really just for demonstration purposes and to vet your appetite to maybe do the same analysis uh, in a bit more sophisticated way. Uh, I'm going to look at this table and take the uh, the price value from these three specific dates, uh, just three beautiful days from July 2017. I take them as price and price to price three, and I'm also computing these deltas. It's basically like a percentage difference in the price. Uh, delta one is between uh, the tens and the elevens. And there is also delta two, which is just the change between 11s and 12s. Uh, so I, the result is, it's an SQL. So I'm, I'm still having a table. Basically, every stock we have these three prices. We have the deltas. Uh, now, as I did before, I'm taking those things in uh, using this. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit. Uh, using this use table as vertex attributes. Uh, now I have the same graph we had until now, but with all these uh, all these numbers uh, on it. Uh, there is one more thing I do. Uh, I'm actually computing what is the average data in the second day. Like what, what I really want to do, and I think I forgot to say this, is to predict this data too. Like can we somehow uh, say something about how all of these stocks move? Uh, and when I look at this data too, uh, it can be seen that actually it's a little bit biased. So the the market was having a good day, apparently. Uh, I can also see this as by computing the average here of the of the data. Uh, as a result of this operation, I see that actually the average change in the stocks was 0.68%, which is actually a pretty significant uh, uptick in the in the S&P 500. Uh, so to make the the prediction task more interesting. I'm not going to try to predict which uh, stocks moved up or down, but I want to predict which stocks moved up above average and which stocks moved down uh, above average. So it's very simple. I'm just deriving a new attribute, like I'm basically changing data too. So the new data too is going to be simply the, the old data to minus the average. Uh, with this, we uh, we have a much more uh, much more balanced distribution. So now this is this is much more around zero. I'm throwing away <clears throat> the very extreme ones, uh, just normal outlier detection. So if somebody moves more than five percent, I I just don't care about those. Uh, actually, I'm dropping a surprising. Uh, it's not the only thing I throw away. Sorry, uh, I throw away the ones where where the movement is too much, but I also throw away those where degree is zero. Like the reason I do this is that I'm interested in the graph-based prediction. So I just throw away those uh, isolated points from the graph. I, I don't care about that for this demonstration. So I end up with 180 stocks. All those have a reasonable amount of, of movement and they are also part of the graph. Uh, so, and then I finally derive the, the target attribute that I want to predict. It's very simple. Uh, if delta two is bigger than zero, so it means that the stock moved up more than average, then uh, it's, uh, it goes up, otherwise not. Uh, our task is to try to predict this attribute. 
So first off, uh, standard data science staff, I'm splitting the, the goals app attribute uh, into a, a test and training set. So the result of this is that uh, instead of having a goals app attribute, which is defined on 180 points, I have a goals app test, which is defined on 39 cases and the goals app train, which is defined on the rest. Uh, I'm totally usual stuff. I can only use the training in training and I'm going to, to compute precision on the, uh, on the test set. So let's just first do the most trivial thing that comes to mind. Uh, let's train a, a linear regression based on the previous day's data. Like I look at what happened yesterday, based on that, can the linear regression tell me uh, whether we are going to go up or not? And the answer is, answer surprisingly, is a no. Uh, like we basically have a coin flip accuracy out of this model. Uh, which is of course not surprising at all. Like if you could uh, tell the, the direction a stock moves just based on yesterday, then none of us would be sitting here. We would be already crazy rich and uh, sitting on the Bahamas. So it doesn't work. Uh, what is more surprising is that the next one actually does. So what I do here is that uh, instead of just using the previous day, I drop in into the linear regression model, uh, all these graph centrality metrics uh, that we computed here. So we still keep yesterday's price, but we add in centrality, clustering coefficient, degree, and page rank as parameters. Uh, and if I, do, if I do the model with this, uh, we get a significantly higher accuracy. Of course, we are, this is an extremely hard task, like predicting where a stock goes is it's super difficult. So having this accuracy, actually, I was very surprised when I uh, when I see this. So, so of course, it's not a not a readily applicable uh, thing. Like, like it's not like tomorrow I'm going to to I don't know uh, give my notice at Links Analytics and start predicting stocks because because we do cheat a little bit. Like, of course, we it's enough if we can observe something that on this particular day. Uh, nodes with high page rank tends to, to trend up because we use the training set on that particular day uh, to predict the same day for different stocks. But it's still, I think it's extremely interesting uh, that you can, you can learn these kind of things that on that particular day we are investigating, actually some of these graph centrality metrics is helpful <clears throat> in predicting the, the direction as that goes. Uh, so the next line here, Nothing too exciting, but just wanted to show off like that we are still within links height. Uh, you can easily do some more stuff. It's like, okay, I can use a decision tree instead of a, instead of a logistic regression. Yes, in fact, uh, the result is, is even better uh, than the previous. Now we are at 72% uh, percent accuracy. Um, and finally, uh, what you can do is, is do something even more sophisticated although the results are going to be a little bit weaker, is to, to do a GCN classifier. Like in this case, we are using a, a graph convolutional network, which is a neural network model uh, designed exactly to, uh, to capture the structure and capture the information flow within a graph. So if we are using a GCN classifier, it's very easy in Sky to just drop in this box. Uh, we are creating here some features, like we create a feature vector from the very same attributes than before. Uh, we throw it into this train GCM box, uh, but you can see there are a bunch of uh, hyperparameters here, which is like yeah, always the, the drawback of a more complex method. And then we get another prediction using GCM. Actually, this is worse than the, the decision tree, but to tell the truth, I didn't spend much time to trying to get this, get this great. Uh, probably if you tune this right, it, it could take over. The point is really that that we are still within Link Skype and you can you can play around with all these classical metric uh, techniques and even these uh, more sophisticated graph-based machine learning are uh, at your fingertips. But I know that uh, most of you are probably doing way more uh, sophisticated models than than what I show here, and you probably already have your your machine learning framework to uh, to work with. Uh, so in this case. Uh, it is actually worse to, to come to Linkskite, generate a lot of different uh, graph-related metrics, and, and then you can literally just export this data and then, then get it into your favorite uh, machine learning framework. So basically what you can do is, uh, 
I can just put it on SQI box. Uh, let's see, here is my graph. I'm actually going to just keep all attributes from the vertices. Uh, and I can I can export it to depending on what's your favorite format. Okay, I can export to CSV. Uh, I guess that works with everybody. Uh, actually, I can I can export this into an HDFS file system or local file system, or I can just uh, download it. And then yes, I just push this export button, and all the data is. Uh, is generated in a CSV file and uh, and then you can use these metrics in in whatever uh, machine learning library uh, you prefer or whatever framework you are already using for for classical machine learning. Maybe one more thing to add, which yeah, uh, exactly because of Marco's question, we actually have this uh, embedding operation. So let me see if this works. So again, of course, a lot of a uh, lot of things. It's basically a node to vec implementation within Linkstride. Like what node to vec means is that you take a take a graph and you try to find coordinates in a in a high dimensional space, uh, which which makes it so that that vertices with similar role in the network uh, are close to each other in this embedding. So Just yeah. A question, Andreas. Um, yep. So this embedding. For now, as I understand, we have only uh, structural features of the graph. But if we have, if we would have like attributes, does the embedding can embed like uh, any kind of uh, features, both structural features and attribute features? So that's a good question. Uh, so the 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 short answer is probably no. So this operation only uses the structure. Okay. But but depending on the kind of attribute, you might be able to cheat. Like it's it's very often possible to to convert an attribute into a into some kind of a graph. And like for example, at the very beginning, what I did is that I instead of having the the sector as an attribute, you can have the sector as vertices connected to the to the other vertices in that sector. If yes. you do this kind of stuff, then you actually encode the, the attribute into the graph structure, and then of course the embedding is going to take that into account. Also, there are other embedding techniques which uh, which are not readily available as a box in Linkskite, but you can basically very easily use uh, Python geometric from Linkskite. And then some of those would actually support it. Like you would have to write a little bit of Python code, but it's very made very, uh, very streamlined. Uh, so anyhow, let's see what happens with these vector attributes. Uh, So yeah, here we get an array. I'm not sure what happens in the CSV file, but basically uh, it, you can definitely export into a Parquet file. Maybe it also works with CSV, I haven't tried. Uh, but basically you, here you have an embedding of the vertex and, and this is very well suited to, uh, to be used in a, in a downstream machine learning algorithm. Okay, I think that's what I had planned for the demo. Uh, any questions?